Welcome, this is Najma Minhas with Global Village Space. I'm joined today with Dr. Muid Youssef, who is the Prime Minister's Advisor on National Security and Strategic Policy Planning. Dr. Muid, thank you so much for joining You're me welcome. today. Pleasure. I'd like to start off by congratulating your government on putting together a very comprehensive and complete dossier on Indian activities to destabilize Pakistan. Um, but what I'm kind of worried about is why did it take you so long? I mean, after all, some of the things you talk about, such as Malik Fridun, um, you talk about him being one of the masterminds behind the army public school massacre. Now, this happened, 144 children and teachers died in 2014. So why so long? So, um, Najma, look, this is the art that you deal with when you bring out this kind of information. Mm -hmm. In fact, the real question to ask is, uh, what on earth is the miracle that our eastern neighbor performs? Every time there is a violent attack in India, five minutes later, a playbook is uh, dusted, brought off the shelf, um, and here is Pakistan, here is this group, here is that group, here is how they came, uh, here is the uh, documentation and whatever. That is deceit. This is very complicated business. I don't belong to the intel world. Mm. Um, uh, but when one educates oneself on this, what is not difficult is catching a culprit, finding out the pieces of information. But to put this together, to connect the dots, um, it's not overnight. You get leads, you catch people, and then you connect. So um, everything that we've put out, uh, except the APS link, mm -hmm. is from the past two, two and a half years. And that's the hard work. The APS um, connection, uh, because of the agricultural university attack, mm -hmm. is which that's what led us to get to the mastermind. Okay. So that's new information, wasn't available at the time, and that's where the dots were connected. Now, also keep in mind, sometimes it's entirely possible that you have information, but you're 99% sure. You're not 102% sure. And when you put something out with the state stamp on it, you've, you're giving it to the world, you're giving it to the UN. This is information we were 150% sure about. We've got tons more, uh, which we're still working through. And as we've said, there is more to come. Okay, but I mean, you mentioned yourself that India puts out information and puts the blame on Pakistan within five minutes, in your own words. Within five minutes, India has already told us yeah, because it's this attack happened and yeah. Pakistan is behind yeah. it. Now, it's been five years. We're still waiting to hear about Gulbash and Yadav, for example. He was arrested in March 2016, and we've yet to receive a dossier on him. No, but see, these are the processes. You, I understand I, I the processes, be, but... No, but we should be proud of the fact that we're a responsible state that does things according to international law and norms, right? Kulbash and Yadav's case has gone to ICJ. India took the case mm -hmm. there. Now it's sub -judice. There is a process that's taking place. We are fulfilling the three requirements that ICJ had. And so once that process is over, there will be but a lot more But nobody's stopping you about. from giving public information about his activities. Yeah, but maybe we think that it's not right for our case at this point, right? So, I mean, there are, there are right. always reasons okay. why but states let, Let's go back decisions. to the fact that the Indians within five minutes publish and state that Pakistan is behind any terror attack in their country. What do they achieve by this? What they're achieving is you had an attack, there were an emotional response to that attack, and straight away the world knows that this country, whether it's right or wrong, this country is responsible. What we achieve is six years ago, 144 children and teachers died. It was an atrocious slaughter of children. If you, six years later, nobody has emotions about that event any if longer. If you're going to put a proposition in front of me as an official, uh, as somebody who's advising the prime minister, I've got an option to create sensationalism with a lie or a half-baked fact, or I am going to be responsible. Emotion may have disappeared although I don't believe that it will ever disappear uh, on, no, something like APS, oh, on something like APS, um, I would take the latter. And why would I take the latter? Today, um, you can look over the past two years, every Western outlet uh, is calling out India mm -hmm. on not only what is happening in Kashmir, which is not their territory, but even within India. Now, when they talk about, oh, Pakistan, it's a broken record. Why? Because they've used that lie for too long. No, but you say when, that because you're a Pakistani, right? No, no, no. I, I'm, whenever, even when I was sitting in the US, mm -hmm. there was a very clear conversation. 
oh, we call India a natural ally of the US. Is it? Is it really the country that we think it is? These things do catch up. I'm not saying that we should always take this long or whatever. We will do what is right. Yes, there are downsides. It's less glamorous. It's less shiny and well, all of that. Well, is it because you're taking the morally superior position that we're doing when we have 100% information? But is it actually because you feel that the international community would not believe you if you came yeah. out within five yeah, minutes? Of course, of course. Look, uh, I'm not one of those who's going to sit and give you the party line on everything. India has made a lot of effort, especially since 9-11, to malign Pakistan internationally. Mm -hmm. They've spent millions of dollars. We've shown you a glimpse in the dossier as well with FATF and what they've been right. doing. We put letters out. Uh, I used to sit in Washington, see that all the time, right? Today, you go to Washington and tell them you want to hold events, conversations on the dossier. You'll get 5% response. Why? It's bad for business, right? So they have created propaganda. We talk about lobbies or whatever. I don't like to use that word, but basically mm -hmm. they have created a negative perception about Pakistan. Now, the reason they've been able to create that is not that they had facts on their side. There was a convergence of interests with India uh, over strategic issues in the region, as we know. But second, there was another problem there. Afghanistan was the focus. Afghanistan was where US troops were. And hundreds of US servicemen and diplomats served in Afghanistan and went back, taking back the Kabul view of Pakistan. So it became much easier for India to do that. Mm -hmm. Yes, we didn't have that space. And yes, you are right that the burden of proof is on us, but not for long. When we do these things responsibly, we've done one, we'll do a second, we do third, we do fourth. Over the next two, three, four years, you will realize what I've publicly said and privately. But you've had 19, according to your dossier, you've had 19,000 terrorist attacks. Wait, wait, wait. Right? Hold so on. you've done it all sensibly. Where, where has that achieved you? No one is giving you credit no, but why do, you, why do you say that? I mean, look, today, when we talk about the Samjhota Express, doesn't the world recognize what has happened? You had the same story from India right. five minutes after Samjhota, right. Right? right? We had two options. At that time, react with sensationalism. Yes, I mean, flawed system, all of that is true. The world is not a fair place. Mm. But ultimately, facts are on our side. And what will change? Let me tell you, mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm almost positive about this. In a year or two, what you will find is that those who made India the darling of the West, who talked about India as the counterweight or whatever, will recognize, they've begun to recognize already, that it's a liability. You, mm. you create a counter with something that has some capacity, springs under them. What is happening with India, what India is doing to itself, what India has created for the world, it is a liability today. I will. I want to see what the world says about human rights two or three months from now when the reality of Kashmir, which dawned on them two years ago, has still not been talked about, begins, uh, you know, uh, to be talked about. This is, yes, I completely agree with you. Your question will continue to be relevant for the next six months, 12 months, but not longer than that. Okay, so on the dossier, what is the hardcore evidence that you've provided which proves to even the most critical opponent of Pakistan that, yes, India is behind this. I mean, I mean, look, what kind of hardcore evidence have you given? Uh, you've got a very clear sense of that through the presser that mm -hmm. the foreign minister did. How? Uh, you've got three or four categories there. You've got categories of terror financing. We've shown you receipts. We've shown you bills. We've shown you bank transactions, mm -hmm. which, by the way, connect very clearly with the FinCEN leaks that had happened in right. which Indian banks were... were identified as yeah. doing illegal transactions. Second, there are actual terrorist attacks and we've named people. We've actually shown you how the money was transferred in a lot of cases. We've shown you Indian officials visiting militant camps mm -hmm. who were then going to operate. We've shown you audio clips. Then we've shown you where they do terrorist training. We've shown you video clips of the IEDs and how they're sort of getting them planted and all okay. of that. AJKGB. We've shown you clearly what their plan is in GB. We even know for a fact what kind of things they were thinking of or, or doing. And then the CPAC cell. I mean, mm -hmm. that takes the cake. Um, right. A the prime minister of a country sitting on top of something, seeing how to sabotage one of the biggest economic initiatives of two of its neighbors. Mm -hmm. What else 
can one put out? I mean, show me one other country that has put out this kind of information, this publicly and boldly to the world. Well, we'll come to what response you've got to that. But before but, that, sorry, sure, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that, you know, we can have this conversation in the public domain. Information is not enough or it could have been this or that. When foreign intelligence agencies evaluate this, and they must be evaluating this as we speak, right? right? We've given it to the P5 and UN. They are part of that world mm -hmm. and will immediately pick up what is true and what is not true. Which, and they will be forced to recognize mm -hmm. that this is real information. I mean, do you think these foreign agencies would not be aware of a lot of this information already? Maybe they I are. Mean, Maybe they are either. and they can turn a blind eye. The CIA Today, or they have to answer. Today, if they turn a blind eye, we have a question to ask. Mm -hmm. Here is what we provided you. Are you saying it's not true? Come out and say it, mm -hmm. right? So, look, Najman, there Why is, did your government go public with this at this time? I mean, yeah, is it I a change gonna, in gonna government strategy? You know, there are two ways to, to do these things. One is a traditional conservative way of saying, we know, but we're not going to go there. It's going to mm -hmm. create a mudslinging match. One's going to say this, you know, whatever. One change that I am desperate for, uh, I have advocated, and others, I mean, it's not just me, when I came into the system, I'd been an, uh, a scholar for most of my life, right. so worked off open source information analysis. What I realized was, we have nothing to hide. Why are we so shy? Why are we so worried about what others are going to think of us? It's, it's not a beauty contest. Right, right. We, to my mind, this is my personal view, right. we've been too cautious in our approach with oh. the world. There's nothing to hide. We've got to be proactive. We've got to be on the front foot. I'm not saying aggression. I'm not saying uh, emotional. Right. Nothing. Pragmatic, reasoned, but proactive and on the front foot. Mm -hmm. If there is a narrative, we have a counter narrative. And we need to create proactive narratives. Right. That's the change I think our uh, engagement with the world has to bring. Right. If we remain... Uh, it's almost like we feel guilty about upsetting people. Well, if the facts are with us, I have no okay, problem so given with the that. fact you've just said that we have nothing to hide, you've only given the media in Pakistan eight pages of this dossier. Now, presumably, you've given it to the P5, to UN, to the EU, so there's not going to be much confidential. And at the same time, if you want the international media to understand and to pick up this story, you need to give it to your local media so that they can put together a coherent and cogent story. But you've only given them five pages. Why? Eight pages, sorry. Yeah, I think, again, I won't speak too confidently on this because there are others who are in the lead and not me. Um, one of the thoughts was that we want the uh, counterparts to digest it. We don't want to make this a conversation where somebody can say, oh, you're just creating a public spectacle out of this, right? But now that time has passed and elapsed and, you know, they've had it. Yes, the next step is so actually... So you're going to give out small parts of the information over Again, time. I won't speak uh, okay. too confidently about this, but yes, absolutely more information will flow. So another thing is um, the 19,000 terrorist attacks and the 83,000 casualties that have been affected. Do we have lists of their names on, let's say, the Ministry of Interior's website, for example? Can oh. we identify these people who've, who were killed under the terrorist attacks? I don't think it's public. I mean, Why of course, not? Um, I'm pretty sure that, you know, the, the lists, I, I don't know the 83,000 names. And 83,000, of course, are casualties. Mm -hmm. um, the state would, of course, know uh, where something happened and who was identified and who wasn't. But I'm not entirely sure if, if they're public information. Uh, I can check, but I'm not I'm uh, not aware. Do you intend to give out information, for example? But, what about... I mean... I'll give you the example of Mexico. I don't know, it's just a personal view. I'll give you the example of Mexico, for example. After the drug wars, Mexico put together a list and actually put up a commemoration for these people um, about the, drug, the people who died from the drug wars. Um, the US has done it for Vietnam War. Isn't this something we should no, be I doing? Think, should we not be very, commemorating our people? I think it's a very good idea. I it's mean, a very good idea and... Uh, it's I, part of your narrative building, which you've referred to. I think it's a very good idea, not only for narrative, but I think recognizing people. I was just going to say, before you ask this question, uh, putting myself in, in those shoes, uh, you know, is, would I want something like this out? Uh, God forbid, if it were uh, somebody I knew or my family culturally. But maybe you're absolutely right. I mean, it's worth, worth a thought. What about the Pakistani collaborators? And there must have been a lot of Pakistani collaborators. I mean, do we will we find out who those people were and 
what kind of action is taking place against them? Some of it, of course, you know, some people uh, are no more. Mm -hmm. Some people are not in Pakistan, right? So there are people who perpetrators, who are uh, conduits, who are sitting in many countries in the world. Mm -hmm. Some we know and some, of course, uh, are at large. Uh, others where cases are already there. So, you know, Ajmal Pahari's case, okay. and that's where a lot of the testimony or some of the testimony also benefited us in terms of evidence. So, I would say there are three categories. Some that are going through the process or are about to go through the process. Some that, quite frankly, we would love to have in our custody and okay. don't. And others who, who, who died. So, what are the next steps now on the dossier? I mean, have you raised these questions with the Indian government? Have you given them your dossier? No. No, we haven't. So I think the, the idea really is to get the international community, mm -hmm. UN and everybody to do whatever they want with it in terms of looking at the evidence, do their analysis. Once they are convinced that this is true, and they will be, there's no, no other mm -hmm. way, then that's the conversation, both diplomatic, legal. There are a number of, by the way, legal recourses here, right? right? Uh, listings and other things. Najma, this conversation that the world has had for way too long, mm -hmm. that there is one victim and one uh, country that's to blame mm -hmm. has to end. And this is the start of that, that effort. It's not going to happen in six months. It's okay. not going to happen in a year. It's a long drawn, drawn out process. But there's one country in this region that's there for the world to see that has a relationship of conflict with each of its neighbors. Right. That country is India. So counterweight or no counterweight, this self-contained reality has to dawn on the world. We're going to play our part and we seriously hope that the world plays So itself. you're expecting the international community to have a word with India. I mean, for example, the P5 who you've spoken to, um, they will have strategic relations with India. Four out of the five, India buys huge amounts. Of, in fact, it spends billions of dollars on military hardware. What kind of conversations do you think really will take place I really don't there? care whether they have a conversation. I expect the world to do the right thing. And the Indians... world has never done the right thing. When, how many times has the world done the right thing? No, but when you put Kashmiris out... are still waiting for the world to do the right See, thing. See, when you put out this kind of evidence, hmm. the listing processes do exist. Mm -hmm. The label of state sponsorship does exist. Are yes, you going to go political. towards those listing I will processes. go to every single thing so I can. So, for example, you, uh, the dossier mentions the direct terror financing that Indian banks are doing, along with FinCEN that you mentioned. Are we going to the APG with this evidence? Are we going to FATF with this evidence? Every single legal recourse that is available will be taken. Okay. Obviously. Now, um, we have to play within the rules. We're not going to be India going behind closed doors and telling countries, yes, we know Pakistan's actually qualified mm. to get out of the FATF grey list, but don't let that happen, right? Mm. We are going to do things above board, but whatever that, um, that route is, will be taken, absolutely. What impact does this have now on Pakistan-India relations? I mean, I know that two years ago when the Prime Minister first came in, he made that statement to India that you take one step forward, I'll take two steps forward. How does he feel now? When I did this interview with um, Karan Thapar, the Indian media, um, a couple of months ago, I guess, he specifically told me, and that's why if you see my interview, it was peace, peace and peace again, mm. that this is what I came saying, this is where I am, but we're not dealing with the India mm. that we thought would be there or any rational uh, human being would want um, to be there. With this India, of course, which is trying to tell Kashmiris, oh, Kashmir is done and dusted, uh, which is killing Pakistani citizens every day. So we laid out a very clear uh, path forward. Right. We still stand for peace. He still feels the same way. Are the conditions there? Is this India the India that actually one can take seriously and trust? Absolutely not, unfortunately. I'd like to ask about this National Intelligence Coordination Committee that um, the government has just set up. Was this in response to your understanding and learnings from the dossier, or was this due to the success of N NCOC? I mean, frankly, is, uh, what's this, behind it? What does it intend no, to do? No, but frankly, this I've also, you know, uh, been reading about it. This is media. I mean, we haven't. There is nothing uh, announced. Okay. I also saw that I'm heading that committee. <laughs> uh, You're saying it doesn't exist. It hasn't been announced yet. What I'm saying is that when the state is ready to do something, uh, it will officially come forth and have okay. a conversation about it. Short of that, 
uh, these kind of um, Does it make sense to you to have a committee like that? Absolutely. Not only a committee, but, you know, one of the biggest problems I've, I've felt in my time in office, uh, we're not good at coordinating okay. generally across government. It's not about mm. uh, a particular subject. Um, you know, uh, provincial governments still have chief secretaries in that sense. Right. Uh, the federal government um, does not have that mechanism in place, so it's piecemeal. Uh, and what is more important than security in terms of coordinating? So, you know, whether it's this or anything else, I'm a big fan of creating efficient coordinating mechanisms mm -hmm. as just uh, as an analyst, as a scholar. And wherever we can bring those in, we need to bring those in. But this particular uh, conversation is really news items for now. Frankly. Okay, yeah. okay. So I'd like to I'll take you back to D.C. for a short while. Um, there's a new president that's come in or will be coming in in January. We did a lot on Afghanistan. The whole of the Trump administration admitted that we did a lot on Afghanistan. Zalmay Khalilzad was full of praise for Pakistan's efforts. But we got no... Pr I mean, what was our... What was, what was what were we supposed to get in return? We got nothing in return. I mean, the <coughs> Americans did not help us on Afata, for example. Uh, I quite frankly hope that what we get in return is peace in Afghanistan. I mean, I'm not mm. entirely sure I was ever in... I as in... Um, uh, we were ever in this for a transaction uh, i'm not you know this at least this was in my mindset um fatf ultimately what pakistan has done virtually no country could have achieved in the last two years and we've mm -hmm. got a very clear position we definitely qualify to be out out of the list um you know if it's a completely technocratic body looking at only technical things let's list the countries that are not even close to where we are and still they're not there right so, so that's, to me, uh, very unfair at this point that we still uh, remain in that list. But other than that, in terms of Afghanistan, what we're really looking for, frankly, is an, a political dispensation which Afghans agree on, thus violence ends, and thus we can get on with becoming a real uh, connectivity hub for the region, open up to Central Asia, open up to Afghanistan in mm. every single possible way, extend CPEC to Afghanistan. All of that is a... Uh, is going to remain elusive till, quite frankly, this peace in Afghanistan. What do you see as the difference in relationship between the Biden administration that's going to come in versus the Trump experience that you've had? How do you see things progressing? I actually think as a state, to me, whoever is ruling any country mm -hmm. is the counterpart. Uh, and so I've got to put my arguments to them. I've got to put what I need and I want to put what I expect from them. Right. And that's the conversation you have with any ruler. At this point, what we have been pushing for, what? Regional peace mm -hmm. remains on the agenda and will remain so. Connectivity in the region, Central Asia access, peace in Afghanistan, it will remain on, on the agenda. Bilateral relationships on the economic side are crucial. I don't think we've had enough conversation. Uh, too quickly conversation moves to tactical security issues. Right. We need to bolster that space. There's agriculture, there's IT, um, shale gas in energy. I mean, there's tons of stuff to be done there. And fourth, and perhaps most important, update your narrative about Pakistan. Um, the one thing that will be uh, important is the new administration that comes in. These are all people who worked with Pakistan for a number of years as Obama, Biden. They will have that memory. And the muscle memory will, will kick in to start, restart the conversation from where they left it. Right. We are a very different Pakistan. There's no terrorism. So how do you intend to, I mean, make sure that they start the conversation with that new, fresh... This is the change I'm talking about. We have to be proactive. We can't wait for others to come and start an old conversation and then say, hold on, let's change. We have to be proactive. That's what we are working on right now. Of course, we have a month, month, uh, two months um, before they... Um, you know, come into office. Have you contacted uh, the Biden uh, the Biden team to speak on the dossier, for example? I don't think it would be fair to talk okay. about this here. Uh, but whatever the uh, rules allow, uh, of course, every country will, will okay. honor those and reach out. Okay, so I want to come to this. Um, you are Pakistan's national security advisor. Um, but the next part of your title, sorry, I should say, is you're the advisor on national security and strategic policy planning. You got where I wanted you to go, <laughs> so good. What is the strategic policy planning part so look, that I'm, you are now yeah. leading? So, uh, I'm grateful you've asked this question. A lot of people sort of keep asking about this. India did a whole propaganda. Oh, um, the title is not NSA. I am basically the prime minister's assistant 
on national security defined in its broadest sense. Mm -hmm. A lot of people take this wrongly to say security equals military security. That's been the mindset. Um, no, uh, we look at food security, energy security. It's okay. the broadest sense. Hard security and diplomacy, economic security, and human security, mm -hmm. right? That's the first part, that this is not a tactical operation room. That's not the job. The second part to me is far more important in terms of explaining what it is and why. So why does strategic policy planning come in? Because Najma, one of the biggest weaknesses I think we've had over the years, and that's why somebody like me, I assume, got this job. Otherwise, quite frankly, mm -hmm. I don't have a military background, don't have a political background. Um, we have a number of spaces to think short term, think tactically, make operational decisions. We had no place on the civilian side where the prime minister could task somebody to have long term strategic thinking on national security, broadly defined again. Okay. So I explain this as the second part of my job being the prime minister's think tank, right? And why do I say that? Because without having this prime minister's think tank or long-term vision, the rest of the national security decision-making mm. is always going to be short-term. Okay. Right? So in some ways, I would love to have the title reversed, okay. frankly. And that's how I approach my job. This is the place which it's, it's a shop of ideas that puts out new um, sort of thinking patterns, which actually throws spanners in the works every day. So, you know, I'm also a fairly uh, disliked commodity because the idea is change. The idea is pushing the envelope. If you do that, mm -hmm. then that also informs your short term thinking and decision making. So, and that's the first part. So of the you're talking about strategic communications and internal and external. That's part of it. Thing. But what, what are you doing in that field? In strategic communications? In strategic communications. Tons. I mean, how... Look, first of all, um, you know, without saying too much, we are, I think, we have never been more coordinated in government, civil, within civil and civil military and federal provincial when it comes to the issues that we are dealing with, right? So a lot of times uh, my work also becomes coordinating on issues where separate uh, efforts are being made. Um, you know, we've got um, groups where all stakeholders come together to do virtually everything uh, in in my domain. Mm -hmm. So that in itself, I think, is a big change. What you won't find now, I hope, I hope, I'm too close to the scene, but correct me if I'm wrong. What you won't find now is on these issues, different uh, uh, sort of points of view and conversations mm -hmm. by different people. I'm not, ta not talking politics, that's not my remit. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the conversation on where is Pakistan on Kashmir? Where is Pakistan on the dossier? Um, you won't find that, right? Okay. So dossier is a great example. You had a civilian principal and, and a military representative sitting there and presenting. And then uh, my office and others in the background to, to work on that, right? So mm -hmm. we are trying to coordinate as much as possible uh, in this space. Because one of the key challenges in today's world is speed. Right. You can't wait for um, a file to move through different channels for six days mm -hmm. before you make a decision on something. So those are some of the things that I think are being reformed. You know, what's interesting is August the 5th, um, 2019, we knew is when uh, the Indians changed the status of Kashmir. August the 5th, 2020, they decided to celebrate the Ram Janambhumi Jan Day mm -hmm. on the same day. Mm -hmm. So it took the whole focus of the media away from talking about Kashmir to Ram mm. instead. Mm. Now, is this the kind of thing that we should be thinking of doing in terms of maybe December the 16th or well, some look, other days? Um, if you stick to August 5th, yes, mm. that's what they tried. But quite frankly, they failed miserably. I mean, I'll give you a simple example because, again, that's, a, uh, that's an issue of coordinated uh, messaging. Times Square. I don't know whether you followed or not, but Times Square displayed Kashmir as an issue um, on the main screening, which, as right. you know, is not yeah, yeah. not easy easy yeah. to get, and it wasn't us; it was mm -hmm. Kashmiris, Kashmiri diaspora, whatever. But the more important part: India had bought that space for puja, uh, where Modi was uh, or India was presenting itself as again, you know, this uh, sort of mischievous way of saying India is a land of peace and whatever. That was cancelled 
and space was given to another agenda. Why? Uh, Le Monde carried a three-column story on Kashmir. This is France, right? So I think not, I'm not talking about us. We weren't doing it. The world actually did pick up that there is gross injustice and an anniversary of a day that needs to be marked as a black day. And these are Western outlets that frankly don't do this. Um, of course, they're going to deflect and distract. If they don't have um, something to present as fact, then that's what they're going to do. But I'll also say something else to you, which may or may not surprise you. Countries that succeed do two things simultaneously. They proactively point out what they stand for and where their adversary or somebody else is mischaracterizing them. They don't wait to react. And second, simultaneously, they introspect. Where do we go wrong? Where did we go wrong? What are things that we are weak on? And we change that. It's no fun just continuing to say, I've got everything perfectly lined up. It's just the other. Yes, it's the other in a big part. With it, it's introspection. So if you ask me, what's the broadest vision where I sit? It is putting Pakistan on the map, on the front foot proactively and having very hard internal conversations to remove our blind spots and fix whatever weaknesses we find. And coordination is one of them. Um, so I'd like to ask, how do you think Pakistan can change its perception in the world? So, you know, the starting point on this is what are we for the world, mm -hmm. right? So the first is internal clarity and then you project. And where Pakistan has been treated very unfairly is that we've continued to talk about a different Pakistan the world refuses to acknowledge. The weakness there perhaps has been we haven't been the best communicators either, right? Mm -hmm. So your communication has not been our forte, I would right. think, in the past. And for whatever reason, for the past 10 years, I think the foreign policy was fairly mum on, on some issues. Um, what are we? I would say we need to explain to the world, and we are explaining, and we, you will see more of this. Pakistan wants to be the melting pot of positive global economic interests. How do you do that? You have a geoeconomic location because the geostrategic part of it has only brought us wars, unfortunately. Okay. You've got a geoeconomic location. What do you stand for? Number one, connectivity. Number two, development partnerships, not assistance. And number three, responsibility within to its citizens and responsibility without, which means regional peace, right? Connectivity, CPEC, great example. Where do we want to go? Central Asia, Afghanistan. We even want to go east right. if our eastern neighbor would come to its senses, right? Development assistance, yes, we need assistance. But what are we talking about? Partnerships, interdependence, melting pot. Anybody wants to invest in CPEC, please come. CPEC extended to Afghanistan, brilliant. Other projects, anybody wants to come, yes. Is it an easy path? No. Hmm. We've got to improve our reality. But also, the easiest path in the Middle East is to pick one side. Why are we continuing to say we are the country that can talk to everybody in a friendly manner? We're open to investment from anybody, right? Responsibility within to our citizens, right? What is the Islamic welfare concept? That's essentially what it is. Responsibility without. What is our Kashmir policy? Human rights, international law. Mm -hmm. China, India have a spat. India says, oh, two front war. What does Pakistan do? Tell the world peace is where we want to stand, right? Yes, if you try and do Balakot, you will get a response that you got right. many fold next time. But short of that, that's Pakistan's vision. We want to use our location for connectivity, for economics, for the betterment of our people and the region. This is the conversation to have. When I or, or anybody in my position or, or other officials sit with foreign counterparts, I want to spend 25 minutes explaining Pakistan's vision. In that, you then have a conversation. This vision is not going to be achieved if India keeps doing what it's doing, mm -hmm. if Kashmir remains where it is, Who's losing? The entire world. We're ultimately a nuclear region. You, the West, want Afghanistan to be stable. When do you get access to Central Asia? When it's stable. Right. Invest in Afghanistan. Let Pakistan invest. Let's China, uh, let China invest. You have interdependence. That's the vision Pakistan has. I haven't said anywhere the word terrorism. I haven't said anywhere the word military. Are they missing? No. They're right. very much there. But the world has to understand our framing and where we want to go and recognize that the reason we are unable to fully achieve our vision 
is because they are courting partners in countries who are the agents of destabilization in the region. That's the rub. That's what's got to so be. So I changed. wanted to ask you that we all know what the Doval, Doval, the, um, the Doval doctrine is. What is going to be the Muid Yusuf doctrine? Peace, peace, and peace. Economic stability, geoeconomic location used to its best advantage. You'd be surprised, uh, Najma, that this office, supposedly national security, spends most of its time talking about the linkage between economic security at the core and military and human security mm. flowing from that and connected uh, through a symbiotic relationship. Let me also tell you what my counterpart is doing. I'm not making this up or maybe you already know and that's why you're smiling, getting articles written against Pakistani officials and institutions, walking out of meetings because there is a legitimate map of another country on that country's officials wall, mm. leading the intelligence operations under the guidance of his boss to undermine CPEC, and openly talking about the fact that AJKGB, there will be military action in a nuclear environment that's what is happening on the other side. Mm. Should I or anybody sitting here respond in the same petty and childish manner? No. We are going places and they're feeling the heat. Two years from now, my dream for Pakistan, whether I'm here or anybody else is here, is that conversation becomes so useless for the world that they talk to Pakistan about what I'm telling you and say, forget about the neighbor, their liability as they are. That's the goal we have. We're not going to play at their pitch and certainly not come down to their level. We thank you so much for your time today. It's a pleasure.